Alrighty, hi, I'm Dusty and welcome back to my lab. Uh, today for Project Podcast, we're going to uh, go over some of the more interesting things that I came across this past week. I um, want to make sure that my stream is actually working. I think it is. I think there's just a little bit of a lag. Yep, okay, cool. Alrighty. Cool. Hi, I'm Dusty and... Alright, so... <clears throat> first things first. So... First of all, uh, I do want to kind of just reflect on last week. So last week I did a similar thing. Uh, I got a little bit of feedback. Um, some of the feedback was that I should uh, go into a little bit more detail on, on each of the different topics. I had a lot to cover last week, so I, I kind of just uh, I kind of just you know skimmed through it. But I think I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. And also like beyond that, I think that. Actually, this is a good example, this morphic resonance thing. I'm going to actually do a little bit of research live um, on the podcast. So, yeah, uh, let me get this um, chat all set up, make sure that if anyone actually messes, no, I, I can see it over here anyway. Okay, cool. Yeah, should be in good shape. Um, okay, cool. So, morphic resonance. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is give you a little... Uh, synopsis my own understanding of what the what the topic is and then we'll basically confirm or deny that by doing a little bit of research um so i came across this via this uh ted talk uh band tick uh, band ted talk that was recommended to me on the algorithm and um it's it's interesting you should definitely watch it um but uh the basic idea behind morphic resonance is it's a little bit uh, fuzzy it isn't totally exact it, it seems like it kind of like sp uh, spills over into a few different uh, areas um, but the idea is that so whether we're talking about a crystallization so it seems like patterns um, or also the actual learning of not of uh, knowledge or just I guess a natural pattern, uh, even even I guess a synthetic one, and, and one the one example. The idea is that the first time, which I mean, we'll parse out like what's problematic about this particular idea. The first time that a crystal that we hypothesize, the first time that a crystal forms, it supposedly forms uh, easier and faster. So easier. I don't know if easier is the right word, but it it forms quicker and. Um, more readily, it seems, than the first time that it was ever synthesized. And, uh, I mean, that's just, that's odd. I mean, it's not to say that that's like a quantum phenomena, even though, I mean, everything has quantum mechanics, you know, uh, involved with it. Um, it. It kind of reminds me of the action at a distance phenomena, where there's debate over whether or not it's an actual thing and, and like, what is actually happening and... When, when basically the uh, the waveform collapses and and you differentiate the different spins uh, of entangled uh, objects, basically, uh, Bean is circling me now, so he might be trying to. No, nope, yep, he's trying to jump on me. All right, Bean. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I wanted to like look into this a little bit more. Uh, yeah, and so. <laughs> like a, a, a biological example of this is that apparently rats that are taught a maze in one area of the world will actually um, somehow tr like like it's hypothesized or theorized that they're somehow transferring the knowledge or there's some type of phenomena occurring where rats elsewhere in the world will also le learn a similar or the same maze faster for some reason and it's unclear why um so my own example is Newton and Leibniz, and like, I think that the first time that I ever heard about this, I, like, you know, it, it kind of reminded me of um, people having premonitions, and like, uh, I, I mean, the way that I've always thought about that is is just that um, it's uh, when someone has a premonition. I thought that if there ever was any type of credence to that idea, that really it was. <clears throat> It was really just that, like, people were being subconsciously, like, uh, influenced or, like, uh, basically, like, preloaded. And, that, like, even though it wasn't, it's not, like, readily available and conscious, 
to them. They are, are like subconsciously actually ruminating and, and machinating on, on the, the different subliminal things in their environment that they've seen. Similar to like how you get like a bad vibe in a room or whatever else. Um, or like you get like, you know, and, and this is also, it's, I, I think, kind of related as far as like se- things that seem supernatural, but you would think that there should be some type of um, real world phenomena occurring that makes some type of sense. Like, you know, you feel like someone's watching you and you, you know, your, your hair stands up on the back of your neck, things like that. Um, and like, I, I just kind of like my, the, the way that Newton and Leibniz are involved is that the way that I always thought about and you get when you get seemingly uh, convergent invention or or scientific breakthrough, technological breakthrough, I've always just kind of chalked it up to the fact that, okay, culturally and scientifically and technologically, two different people were happened to be uh, just exposed to the same type of stuff that was available at the time. So it's like, it wasn't that they were... <laughs> transferring knowledge or like or learning the same thing at the same time and thus helping each other in some weird way like this is trying to imply but just that they had the same resources they had the same stuff laying around so they it just it just so happened that they would uh, and they had the same problems to deal with to some extent and in that they they you know were growing up in the same age so they they both had the need to to invent the thing that they invented um but yeah, so let's actually like look into this a little bit more. Uh, this guy Rupert Sheldrake, I'd never heard of him before. This this TED talk, uh, I, I honestly forget his his credentials. Um, but we're just gonna do a little search here. He's the he's the creator of the theory. Let's go to his page. Okay. Morphic resonance is a process whereby self-organizing systems inherit a memory from previous similar systems. In its most general formulation, morphic resonance means that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. The hypothesis of morphic resonance also leads to a radically new interpretation of memory storage in the brain and of biological inheritance. Memory need, need not be stored in material traces inside brains, which are more like TV receivers than video recorders, tuning into influences from the past. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I've heard of, uh, so like, I'll just muse a little bit on what this is reminding me of. <clears throat> um, I've heard people say things like, uh, consciousness isn't a result of material interactions, but actually somehow more like the act of an antenna accessing something else, uh, and they'll reference things like um, out-of-body experiences, which I've been thinking a little bit more about recently, and it is really curious how anything like that is even possible. Um, and similar hallucinations are possible. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I've always kind of, like, not always, but I, you know, I've, I've entertained the idea, but I've just, I've, I've kind of, like, landed and, and kind of thought that it really isn't that, and it really isn't any less amazing or miraculous that it's basically just material interaction because i mean what is material anyway you know i mean what's material is only what's uh what like what what interacts with other things in a material way it isn't it isn't like realness i mean realness itself is only uh the ability to interact with something you know if it, it really I mean, if we, is dark matter real? I mean, it, it does seem to interact with our, with the things that we already consider real. So I, I, you'd have to say yes. So, um, I don't know. I mean, th- this is, it's super interesting. I, I mean, as far as the crystal thing, I wonder if he's going to get into that. Cause I mean, so I mean, material traces inside brains. I mean, yeah, that's how I've, I've kind of like, be, like come to think about memory and, you know, ca- the, the computation that the mind does and like how you can um do re- like how, how your brain recalls things like how you can make it uh recall things how you can um you know go, go back through your memory or try to synthesize like a new scenario and i mean that, that that's a little bit i think that that's kind of like the more human aspect of us and and we we call aspects of it that the ego um 
how much like it seems like human beings are are separate from animals because they separate themselves from the environment and and that and the way that we think about that is is with the tool of the ego where i'm i'm this and and you're that and everything else you know is around us and we interact with that whereas animals are are like not conscious of that differentiation or don't create it and so they they just kind of are influenced and and uh reactive to their environment um <clears throat> so all right I mean, he's saying it's not traces inside the brain um more like tv receivers than video recorders and biological inheritance need not all be coded in the genes or in epigenetic modifications of the genes. Much of it depends on morphic resonance from previous members of the species. Thus, each individual inherits <clears throat> a collective memory from past members of the species and also con contributes to the collective memory, affecting other members of the species in the future. That's, yeah, that's kind of like the best way to think about this in, in terms of the biological uh, facet of it and that it, it's, it's like collective memory. Um, this hypothesis was first put forward in my book, uh, New Science of Life, in 1981 and discussed in greater detail in my main theoretical work, The Presence of the Past, published in 1988. See morphic fields for a general introduction to the theory. Okay. Okay. We'll read through this quick. This isn't too much. <clears throat> In the hypothesis of formative causation discussed in detail in my books, A New Science of Life and The Presence of the Past, I propose that memory is inherent in nature. Most of the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. So something that comes to mind is that similarly to how it's, we get the intuition that the interference pattern that we see uh, in quantum mechanics that's, that's produced in the double slit experiment, it like makes us have this intuition that it's almost like nature is saving energy and that it, it, it's it's only producing a result when we observe it which really is just like entangle ourselves with it but um th this reminds me of that and that it would make more sense like if you were if you were building something for efficiency rather than re-encoding the entire world into someone's brain which is kind of like a crazy thought and that if you think the more materialistic and straightforward view like I've been recently, it's like everything that you see and interact with, like with your mind and like, you know, it, there, there happens to be a, a correlation and, and it's really close between me touching this table and then the, the feeling and sensation that I get and then the the actual objective reality of, of, of the fact that it is there. Um, fundamentally everything that i'm experiencing about it is reproduced in my mind so there's it's only a representation of the table and it's just it's hard to believe that um every single brain has th like th the full depth of of our full conscious experience and that it isn't that our conscious experience all accesses like some fundamentally uh, objective reality and that it, it, it is um, like more of a reference rather than a rebuilding like it's it, rather than a, a full simulation it's 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 just a reference to what already exists and that would be more that would be more energy efficient I mean energy efficient whatever that means like it would be a more efficient way it's like a pointer rather than like a rebuilder um, my interest in evolutionary habits arose when I was engaged in research and developmental biology and was reinforced by reading Charles Darwin, for whom the habits of organisms were of central importance. As Francis Huxley has pointed out, Darwin's most famous book could more appropriately have been entitled The Origin of Habits. Hmm. Morphic Fields in Biology Over the course of 15 years of research on plant development, I came to the conclusion that for understanding the development of plants, their morphogenesis, genes, and gene products are not enough. Morphogenesis also depends on organizing fields. The same arguments apply to the, development, to the development of animals. Since the 1920s, many developmental biologists have proposed that biological organization depends on fields, variously called biological fields or developmental fields or positional fields or morphogenic, morphogenetic fields. 
Wow, okay, he's got lots of synonyms here. All cells come from other cells, and all cells inherit fields of organization. Genes are part of this organization. They play an essential role, but they do not explain the organization itself. Why not? Thanks to molecular biology, we, do, we know what genes do. They enable organisms to make partic particular proteins. Other genes are involved in the pro control of protein synthesis. Identifiable genes are switched on and particular proteins made at the beginning of new developmental process processes. Some of these developmental switch genes, like the Hox genes in fruit flies, worms, fish, and mammals, are very similar. In evolutionary terms, they are highly conserved, but switching on genes such as these cannot in itself determine form, otherwise fruit flies would not look different from us. What? That's, that's a pretty big claim. I'm not sure how, <laughs> how uh, they're getting there. Um, many organisms live as free cells, including many yeasts, bacteria, and amoebas. Some form complex mineral skeletons, as in diatoms and radiolarians. Spectacularly pictured in the 19th century by Ernst Haeckel, by Ernst Haeckel. Just making the right proteins at the right times cannot explain the complex skeletons of such structures without many other forces coming into play, including the organization activity of cell membranes and microtubules. Hmm. Alright, what am I thinking here? It definitely is becoming more clear that we're, we really are uh, shaped by not only our genes, but, but also our environment. And I mean, I guess what like what this makes me think of is is just the idea that all of the genetic uh, selection that that occurs and all of the the phenotypic expression is is influenced by the same gravitational force of the Earth. So it all evolves within that parameter, and so it, it like the gravity itself is kind of a parameter. It, like it is necessary and contributes to the. Uh, to the structure of it itself and what it is and and it, it's it's in t like the structure of the genome and the phenotype is impossibly entangled with the 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 environment in which it it was selected in okay gotta remember i should start like putting my cursor somewhere so i like where i left off most developmental biologists accept the need for a holistic or integrative conception of living organization. Otherwise, biology will go on floundering, even drowning in oceans of data. As yet, more genomes are sequenced, genes are cloned, and proteins are characterized. I suggest that morphogenetic fields work by imposing patterns on otherwise random or intermediate patterns of activity. For example, they, use, they cause microtubules to crystallize in one part of the cell rather than another even though the subunits from which they are made are present throughout the cell. Morphogenetic fields are not fixed forever, but evolve. The fields of Afghan hounds and poodles have become different from those of their common ancestors, wolves. How are these fields inherited? I propose that they are transmitted from past members of the species through a kind of non-local resonance called morphic resonance. So non-local, that, that, that's kind of, that's the exact terminology that's used when it comes to the, uh, the, entang the quantum entanglement and waveform uh, decoherent. Well, no, that's the wrong word. Waveform collapse. So when you when you have two entangled uh, particles and you measure one, the the, the effect is called non-local because when you find the when you differentiate the spin of one of the particles, you automatically know the one of the other, and and that seems to break locality, which is that it it, it is. Im like instantaneous information transfer and there's a lot of debate over what that means and like what what that could like what's actually happening <clears throat> getting fur all over me bean the fields organizing the activity of the nervous system are likewise inherited through morphic resonance conveying a collective instinctive memory each individual both draws upon and contributes to the collective memory of the species this means that new patterns of behavior can spread more rapidly than would otherwise be, be, be possible. For example, if rats of a particular breed learn a new trick in Harvard, then rats of that breed should be able to learn the same trick faster all over the world, say in Edinburgh and Melbourne. 
There is already evidence from laboratory experience discussed in A New Science of Life that this actually happens. So that's pretty much what I said, and that, that was my understanding of it. They're, they said trick, and I said maze, but it's probably similar. They could probably teach my maze, too. The resonance of a brain with its own past states also helps to explain the memories of individual animals and humans. There is no need for all memories to be stored inside the brain. Okay, so then that's also kind of like what I was imagining. Social groups are likewise organized by fields, <clears throat> as in schools of fish and flocks of birds. Human societies have memories that are transmitted through the culture of the group and are most explicitly communicated through the ritual reenactment of a founding story or myth, as in the Jewish Passover celebration, the Christian Holy Communion, and the American Thanksgiving dinner, through which the past becomes present through a kind of resonance with those who have performed the same rituals before. The memory of nature. Maybe they're going to talk about the crystal now. From the point of view of the hypothesis of morphic resonance, there is no need to suppose that all the laws of nature sprang into being fully formed at the moment of the Big Bang, like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code, or that they exist in a metaphysical realm beyond time and space. Th oh yeah, this is something else that he said in that TED Talk, is that he thinks that like the constants of nature, so like things like the acceleration of gravity and all of that actually slowly change over time. And I don't see any reason to think that that doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't think that there's anything that is static completely. You know, things have, have generalities. Like, they, they have general forms, and, and like that, that's kind of like the whole gist of quantum mechanics, is that, that things are, are just probabilistic. Ooh, I'll give myself a second here. All right. Um, okay. So he actually goes back to a data set and then shows that the, the the measured speed of light like across a number of peer groups actually like ch fluctuated for like 10 or 15 years or something and they have no explanation other than that they must have done it wrong because they, they have the assumption that the constant is just that constant before the general acceptance of the Big Bang Theory in the 1960s, eternal laws seemed to make sense. The universe itself was thought to be eternal, and evolution was confined to the biological realm. But we now live in a radically evolutionary universe. If we want to stick to the idea of natural laws, we could say that as nature itself evolves, the laws of nature must, uh, the, na the laws of nature also evolve, just as human laws evolve over time. But then, how would natural laws be remembered or enforced? The law metaphor is embarrassingly anthropomorphic. Habits are less human-centered. Many kinds of organisms have habits, but only humans have laws. The habits of nature depend on, on non-local similarity reinforcement. Through morphic resonance, the patterns of activity and self-organizing systems are influenced by similar patterns in the past, giving each species and each kind of self-organizing system a collective memory. I believe that the natural selection of habits will play an essential, an essential part in any integrated theory of evolution, including not just biological evolution, but also physical, chemical, cosmic, social, mental, and cultural evolution, as discussed in The Presence of the Past. <clears throat> habits are subject to natural selection, and the more often they are repeated, the more probable they become, other things being equal. Animals inherit the su successful habits of their species as instincts. We inherit bodily, emotional, mental, and cultural habits, including the habits of our languages. Okay. Fields of the mind. Morphic fields underlie our mental activity and our perceptions, and lead to a new theory of vision, as discussed in The Sense of Being Stared At. Oh, yeah, okay. So th there's the uh, there's kind of another thing that I, I thought might be related. The sense of being stared at. So the, the, the idea that you're, you're being looked at and then your, your hair stands up on the back of your neck. Like, what is that? How, how does that happen? It, but it, it does seem like it's a measurable phenomena that they don't have an explanation for. <clears throat> the existence of these fields is experimentally testable through the sense of being stared at itself. There is already much evidence that this sense really exists. You can take part in experiments on this website yourself. Read about the results of the online staring experiment conducted through this site. The morphic fields of social groups connect together members of the group even when they are many miles apart and provide channels of communication through which organisms can stay in touch at a distance. They help provide an explanation for telep telepathy. <laughs> oh boy, he's getting really woo-woo now. There is now good evidence that many species of animals are telepathic, and telepathy seems to be a normal means of animal communication as discussed in my book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Telepathy is normal, not paranormal, natural, not supernatural, and is also common between people, especially people who know each other well. 
In the modern world, the commonest kind of human telepathy occurs in connection with telephone calls. More than 80% of the population say they have thought of someone for no apparent reason who then called, or that they have known who was calling before picking up the phone in a way that seems telepathic. Controlled experiments on telephone telepathy have given repeatable positive results that are highly significant statistically, as summarized in the sense of being stared at and described in detail, detailed technical papers which you can read on this website. Telepathy also occurs with emails, as shown in my paper, An Automated Test for Telepathy in Connection with Emails, Journal of Scientific Explora Exploration, 2009. The morphic fields of mental activity are not confined to the insides of our heads. They extend far beyond our brain through intention and attention. We are already familiar with the idea of fields extending beyond the material objects in which they are rooted. For example, magnetic fields extend beyond the surfaces of magnets. The Earth's gravitational field extends far beyond the surface of the Earth, keeping the, move the moon in its orbit. And the fields of a cell phone stretch out far beyond the phone itself. Likewise, likewise the fields of our minds extend far beyond our brains. Wow. Well, pretty, uh, pretty intense and uh, drastic claims here. I uh, don't really know what to feel or think right now. I mean, I, I, it, I have heard like things like this being the case, like as far as like the actual data and the, the phenomena that they're talking about and that are leading them to, to believe these things. Um, but it's like, you know, this is part of what I'm, what I hope to do is, God, I, he really covered me in fur. I am covered in fur. It's like making me itch. Um, and, uh, okay. <clears throat> morphic fields. Let's just finish the summary here. The hypothesized properties of morphic fields at all levels of complexity can be summarized as follows. They are self-organizing wholes. They have both a spatial and temporal aspect and organize spatio-temporal patterns of vibratory or rhythmic activity. They attract the systems under their influence towards char characteristic forms and patterns of activity, whose coming into being they organize and whose integrity they maintain. The ends or goals towards which morphic fields attract the systems under their influence are called attractors. The pathways by which systems usually reach these attractors are called creodes. That's interesting that they're using the terminology attractor because uh, one of my favorite thinkers, Daniel Schmachtenberger, talks about uh, the third attractor, which is just a possibility other than dystopia and uh, apocalypse, basically. Um, and we need to we need to invent and create that third attractor so that we have something to move towards. And like, basically, the idea is a uh, problem not well stated or understood is impossible to solve. So we need to better understand and I guess this is saying define the the actual possible future so that we can like spread that morphic resonance um and I mean that that is uh that is this reminds me of uh and that that specific concept reminds me of the the, the nucleation points of crystals and kind of why I made I made the the uh, picture of the thumbnail for this the, like that crystal forest that I had the AI make um we need to, like, that. that's kind of how um, knowledge, human knowledge in general, travels. Even if, like, besides any of this morphic resonance and any of that, it's just, you know, it, it, the, the most basic and, and oldest way of thinking about it and the, the phrase is, you know, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish, he, he eats for a lifetime. You teach one man to fish, and then he can teach other people to fish. And that's a nucleation point of knowledge and crystallization point. <clears throat> So pretty cool. Um, still not sure what to think about it. Uh, I'm gonna think. I think I'm gonna actually like do a little bit of a deep dive on my own as far as like into the data. It's like here's my problem. It's I, like I, I I don't here's like whenever you're looking into a scientific field like this, even if he has all this data on here, he it's his data, and so you need to he need to kind of like sample other other first-hand events and, and first-hand experiments that other pe other organizations and people have done you can't just take this guy's data and work and word for it it's just that's how science is supposed to work um still really neat though definitely uh recommend the ted this ban ted talk i'm not sure i don't even remember what why they said that they uh banned the ted talk uh all right so pretty cool stuff um politics of consciousness so oh, filaments dried
um, politics of consciousness. I watched this video a while ago. I'm not, it's not like super fresh in my mind, but I, I did want to bring it up. Um, feel like it, it's kind of related to this. I, I feel like as far as just common sense talking about what consciousness is and, and how it's related to politics and really human rights and uh, all that, he does a great job. He's a, he's a really smart guy. And uh, just, I, I feel like even if he's not completely correct about the way that he interprets and, and defines consciousness, all the definitions that he makes and the, the interpretations that he does, I think are still valid and, and, and relevant as far as the actual political ethics of it. And so definitely recommend that, that video. Um, and I mean, it's like, is it, is it the morphic resonance? Is it, is it something more or like more complex than, and, and, you know, than, than actually encoding all of reality in, into each individual brain? I don't know. I mean, it like, and is that more complex? You know, is, is, is it more complex to like, to reference somehow rather than rebuild? I, I don't know. It, like it, that in and of itself is confusing. Uh, okay. Melting down waste filament. Th this was a great video. Uncle Jesse, he, he, uh, makes, makes good videos. The, the editing style is a little bit over the top for me, but, uh, you know, that, that's what you got to do to be successful, it seems like, nowadays. Um, something that I do want to get into, because I'm tired of waste and filament, is um, I want to, like, be able to melt down mold, uh, melt down my, my waste filament. And uh, you can actually, I don't know if he... Hey, everyone, Uncle Jesse here. Whoa. Last week, I showed you how you could take a whole bunch of your failed 3D prints and scrap and melt them down and turn it into something pretty cool there, there's a bunch of holes in it see like you, there's a bunch of bubbles in it and uh ideally you'd be able to get those out you know to increase your quality so i don't know i'm gonna, I'm gonna think about it i mean i'm thinking maybe like some kind of like vibration table or something so like but then it's it's got that's got to be like heat resistant so maybe you got to shake the entire toaster oven or whatever you heard it ding before um that you know i, I this toaster oven i have just kind of dedicated to drying out filament slash, you know, possibly doing this. Um, it's actually got a little convector in it, a little fan in it. So it, it's actually pretty nice for, for that. Um, but the thing is, is like, if, if I'm going to take my waste filament and, and melt it down into that, that marbleized look like that, I, I want to get all the bubbles out of it. <clears throat> and so maybe, maybe an agitator would be good enough. Maybe there's some like more common sense technique that I could use, but, um, and then like, here's the thing. So he, uh, he prints the actual, he, he prints a mold mold basically. So he, he, he prints a case that he then pours silicon mold forming material into, and then that dries. And then he has a silicon mold that he can then put his, his hard filament into and melt down into a, uh, sorry, just want to check that. Um, that he that he can then you know do do whatever with so like what I'm imagining is for for like car parts they could even like start selling the molds themselves online you know or or the STL file for for a mold creator um, and I mean if if you have like an actual like injection mold uh, technique then then it kind of like really opens up the possibilities as far as different materials that you can use and, and you you overcome a lot of the the drawbacks of trying to do fdm printing or even resin for that matter so i don't know pretty interesting stuff um i think this is important to cover uh this this gas stove ban and uh just like the like green energy in general um i don't know i mean i i'm i'm definitely uh so first of all Actually, yeah, this is related. So I guess uh, political reasons for that. Adam Ragusi is awesome. I, I recommended his stuff in the last uh, last podcast. He he does a he he gives this a really measured look, and uh, he actually has another gas stove video that he had made before any of this controversy occurred, and uh, I haven't watched that one yet. <clears throat> um, but. I mean, here's where I'm at with it. I mean, th there might be something to it if you have young kids in the house and, and you should probably take it into consideration, but it's, it, it's, um, and, and like, maybe we should move towards actually having vent vented fume hoods in our houses so that, you know, even though they're, they're more wasteful and that's why I've got a bunch, like a bunch of bullet points under here. Um, 
And then also, let's open up this one, because this is related. So if you haven't watched this, you should really watch this too. Um, it's pretty quick. It basically, the gist is that the the majority of the cobalt that we're getting for our, our rechargeable lithium batteries, which is a doping agent uh, for, for the batteries to make them more efficient and, and more rechargeable and all that stuff, um, is basically mined by what are called artisan miners, which is basically a guy down in a hole with a hammer <laughs> and, and, a, and a bag. So, and these, these, these people are, are just not taken care of um, in Africa and the Congo. And I, I'm pretty sure it was the Congo. And uh, it's just, we need to be aware of these things. And, and we need to, to actually, you know, can, like t take it into account in, in, the, in the value proposition and, and the, the value calculation of, of how much things cost. It, you know, you know we, we talk about like fair trade coffee. Well, it's like, this, this is kind of like a similar thing by my understanding. Um, we need to take care of these people and, and also, I mean, just give them basic amenities to do their job better, you know, R rather than just throwing human labor at something. It, this is, it's the 21st century. We should be able to do better than that. And, and like, that doesn't mean that we have to, you know, burn the whole forest down either. It, it, we, we can, we can strike a balance here. Um, so kind of a lot of things going on here. As far as like <clears throat> the, 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 the health concerns with the gas stove. I mean, yeah, like I said, I, I like... I guess these charcoal filters work pretty well. I mean, remember to actually change it. I, I don't know. So that, that basically just recirculates the air. You, you like, it sucks up the, the air that, that comes up. That's, you know, frankly combusted, uh, exhaust from, from a natural gas stove. And th there are some not so good stuff. There's not some not so good stuff in there. I mean, like it isn't completely pure. Um, and ideally, you know, you, 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 you exhaust and vent all that shit out, out of your house. Um, but <clears throat> one second, the problem with it, with exhausting it out of your house is that then, in, especially in the winter, well, also in the, in the summer, you're, you're, you're getting rid of your tempered air. So whether you're cooling your house in the summer or heating it in the winter, you're just wasting energy. So that's why the charcoal filters have gotten more popular I have to look into whether or not the charcoal filters actually like filter everything that, that the natural gas stoves actually put out, um, which maybe we should look into that quick. Let's, let's actually research that. Okay. Let's see if this looks reasonable. All right, let's skim it. <clears throat> Although charcoal filters and carbon filters are used in ductless rain, ductless rain, duck, ductless range hoods, they are less effective than the stainless steel baffle and mesh filters used in ducted range hoods in trapping grease and smells. It is far preferable to have a ductless range hood than no ventilation at all. Air is circulated via a fat filter and an activated carbon filter in a ductless range hood. The recirculating range hood captures part of the gases and scents while the latter captures fat and is in the air. That is in the air. Ductless range hoods should, in theory, operate flawlessly, just like gas masks. They also make dirty air breathable by using baffle filters, charcoal filters, or carbon filters. However, there are issues that contribute to range hoods' less effective air filtration. There are a few things you might want to think about before you buy a recirculating or ductless range hood. You gonna jump up, Bean? I'm, I'm gonna skim this quick and then I'm gonna try to hone in on what's important. You wanna jump up? You gonna get me covered in fur again? Well, let's just read this quick. Um, 
The Duckless Range... All right, so Duckless Range Hoods. That's really hard to say. Pros. The Duckless Range Vents are great for people living in small apartments. Since they don't have enough space for such equipment, it would be hard for their exhaust vents to eliminate unwanted air. It is also less expensive compared to the ducted hood. Non-vented range hoods also work well in an island range hood set. And that makes sense because when you have an island, it's a lot harder to, to actually get the, the duct work itself out of the room. I mean, if, if it's isolated, right, as an island always is. Compared to the ducted system hoods, the ductless range hood is a, is a type of quiet range hood. The ductless range hood circulates air and smoke without making noise. Cons. On the other end, the ductless range hoods aren't safe for cooking activities like frying, grilling, se severe smoking, and other types of cooking. Sometimes the ductless range hood works inefficiently with the, tar with the charcoal filter. Its filter could get clogged, hence making the ductless range hoods, hoods safe is almost impossible. A ductless range hood cannot be used with outdoor grills since it cannot efficiently dispose of the smoke. <clears throat> Ducted range hood. Pros. The ducted system helps to remove smoke and dusty air from any part of your home and kitchen. This feature allows you to experience better indoor air quality and dust-free home. It can work as an island hood to ensure all smoke and bad air is sucked away. The ducted exhaust systems are easy to maintain and eliminate bad odor, odor faster than ductless range hoods. <laughs> this is not, not written very well. The ducted hoods operate with better efficiency compared to ductless range hoods because of the ducted systems. However, the, ductus, the ductless range hood works with more fans and seemingly faster efficiency. That doesn't make sense. However, ducted systems, du ducted system hoods work better for outdoor cooking since the vent hood is supported by the HVAC system. Cons. Compared to ductless range hood, the ducted hood requires a pro professional for installation. Yeah, because you need, you need to make an external penetration into your house. So, you know, if you have brick, it's especially hard or, or stone or whatever, because it's just a lot, a lot harder to make an external penetration. Um, its installation is a very tricky process, hence we advise that you choose one of our experts. Ah, they have, they have experts. The ducted vent hood also requires duct work for it to efficiently propel, propel air out of your cooking area. Okay. Well, I mean, so th this is what I'm imagining. So th it sounds like these recirculators are kind of garbage. I mean, like, yeah, they'll... Uh, getting out of there. I don't want that chat popping up on me. Um, they're, I think that they are kind of garbage, and they're garbage for this reason. It's like, th and, and this is just my intuition speaking, but I, I think that th this makes sense. Especially if you're cooking any any type of, like, like do doing anything heavy duty, like... Um, if you're doing anything heavy duty, then you are going to uh, vaporize, atomize uh, oil particles, and then those oil particles are probably going to grease up your charcoal filter, and then, I mean, I'm sure it still absorbs something, but it, it, it's going to get pretty gunked up pretty, pretty fast, and you're going to have to repeatedly uh, change it. Um, so, I mean, as much as it sucks that your, your fume hood is, like, your proper fume hood is going to exhaust air out of your house... I mean, just try to run it as low as you can. So maybe get like a, a variable speed one if you, if, if possible. Um, so <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, like is what, what this is a little uh, inflammatory. Um, as far as like moving towards green energy, um, whatever that means, renewables. Uh, I'm I'm totally in favor of it. I, I think I think it makes a ton of sense. But we, we have to understand the problem, you know, like again, like like I was taught I was mentioning earlier up here. Um, and the the truth of the matter is that literally every aspect of our society runs on fossil fuels and, and is, is a result of our mastery and and uh, extraction of fossil fuels. And um just for instance, like if, if the entire uh, transport system, so like if, if every car in America became electric overnight, we wouldn't, our power grid would not be able to support that right now in its current state. And like, it, I don't hear that talked about. Like, I, I, I have it on good good authority that like that would not be okay. Like we, we, need, we need to, and it isn't just that there aren't enough chargers. Like it, it's literally that the, the, we don't generate, generate enough electricity and we don't have enough power plants to actually generate it. And so it's not like that would happen, you know, like all of a sudden, every, you know, everyone gets a car. It's like, no, it's, it's not as simple as that. And that, that isn't what's going to happen. But we need to incorporate, you know, that reasoning and logic into the plan. <laughs> you know, like we need to we need to be aware of that in order to actually efficiently make a plan for the for how we're going to go about this. Um, yeah. So here, here it is. Um, 
So, it's, uh, I, I actually, I didn't even watch this whole video. Um, I know, this is great, isn't it? This guy always does a great job, though. He goes into all the math of, of like, whether or not it makes sense. And, uh, I mean, just kind of fundamentally speaking, it, like, when you're trying to transport more than a body, more than your body, and, and or, like, just people in general, like, as a, as a, a, a civilian transport vehicle, <clears throat> like, when you're trying to, to ship freight, it's, like, the, the energy density of the energy density of whatever you're using to do that is is so much more important and like and and that's why the semi doesn't really make a lot of sense and it, it's really just because the the energy density of the batteries versus the weight is is just not there so like you need to pack way too many batteries to get the the power and range that you need to actually tow the the actual freight and then the the thing is is that the weight of the freight is then out is then off balanced by is, is offset by the weight of the battery so it's just, it, it, and then like that, that accumulates. So like they have to, t they're, they're having to take that into consideration when they actually ship their, their product, like anyone's product with a, a Tesla semi, because it just doesn't, isn't, isn't the same numbers as, as a regular semi truck. Um, I mean that, and that's just, that's just the beginning of the problem. Um, this, and this, this just came out. Look, I, I, Elon Musk doesn't need any more hate. I mean, he's get, he's getting plenty of that, but uh, I mean, he's really uh, he's going down. I, like, and and it's it, it's probably just because he he really has been misleading the public on on his technology for a long time now, and uh, continuing to take money. And like, that's that's not really okay. And like, th this is a good example of it. it uh, I brought up in um, in a previous podcast with my buddy uh, T Pan that like the 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 Cybertruck ford f-150 poll is not really a good test and like not really uh d demonstrative of very much and um it's just frustrating to see you know like you you know that something is is not real is is frankly uh what's what's the word uh misleading <laughs> it's just sci scientifically engineering misleading uh and yet, like people buy into it, and like that that hype and and validation seems to be self self uh, self reinforcing, and it's just not really uh, not really easy to combat. Um, so, in this particular recent example, it's come out that uh, the the Tesla that was driving back in 2016 on the video, it, it was I mean, for lack of a better term, faked. I mean, it was it was it was choreographed. It was orchestrated. It was it was cooked. It was it was made up, you know. And uh, apparently, the car like drove into a fence, and they they just scrubbed that from the video. Um, and the thing is, is that like, actually, I'm I'm seeing a parallel right now as I'm talking about this. It, it's like. I mean, you're selling you're selling something that isn't representative of what you actually have. Like, what, what you, you're 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 trying to make someone buy something that isn't what you're actually selling, and like, and that's fraud. I don't know what else to call it. You know, I mean, um, and it's the same thing as this George Santos guy. Like, when you're when you're running for political office, you're selling yourself. You know, you're selling your credentials. You're selling like what you stand for and and your policy stances. And if literally none of that is, and then if literally none of that is true, then you, you have, you have sold a product that you do not have to sell. <laughs> and, and it's, it's just the fact that he's going to stay there and like, and still do this job is just so, it, it's so insulting. I mean, like as an American, it, it's, it's just so, so frustrating. And the fact that, I mean, Republican, Democrat, who cares? I mean, I'll just say politician. The fact that like the, the McCarthy has the ability and the power to to out him, but he won't because it's it, he's helpful for him in that he can continue to vote for for his side, is just so scummy. I you know I don't I don't have a better word for it. it it's just it's just not right, and um, it really shows. It really it's it's a demonstration of character and and, and like the name of the game. It seems like in in politics and and frankly, it seems like the modern age in, in general. It's not just politics. It's just you know, get yours while you can and screw everyone else. And and it's just uh, I don't know. I I don't want to be cynical, but at the same time, that that's how it feels. And we we have to talk about it and identify it and and say that's wrong. And and I I think that this is wrong. They're like. You know whether it's whether it's selling 
selling a fake video or or selling a fake version of yourself it's like that's 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 not right <clears throat> um <laughs> this got moved down here okay Oh yeah, oh, hormesis though. So let's just read the de the definition of hormesis. It, it's a, it's a controversial thing. I, uh, I know we're we're gonna use Wikipedia. God forbid. Um, just just to get the concept, just to get the idea, and then I'll I'll just give my thoughts on it. Um, Hormesis is a characteristic of many biological processes, namely a biphasic or triphasic response to exposure to increasing amounts of a substance or condition. Wow, that's a mouthful, huh? Within the hermetic zone, the biological response to low exposures to toxins and other stressors is generally favorable. The term hormesis comes from Greek hor horme hormesis, rapid motion, eagerness, itself from ancient Greek hormeion, to set in motion, impel, urge on. The same Greek root as the word hormone. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, that makes sense. The term hormetics has been proposed for the study in science or for, of hormesis. In toxicology, hormesis is a dose-response phenomena to xenobiotics or other stressor, stressors characterized by a low-dose stimulation with zero-dose and high-dose inhibition, thus resulting in a J-shaped or inverted U-shaped dose response. The arms of the U are inhibitory or toxic concentrations, whereas the curve stimulates a beneficial response. Generally speaking, hormesis pertains to the study of benefits of exposure to toxins such as radiation or mercury, perhaps analogous to health paradoxes such as the smoker's paradox, although differing by virtue of dose-dependent effects. Microdosing, and to some extent, extent homeopathy, are often regarded as applications of hormesis. In physiology and nutrition, hormesis can be visualized as a hormetic curve with regions of deficiency, homeostasis, and toxicity. Physiological concentrations deviating above or below homeostasis concentrations adversely affect, adversely affect an organism. Thus, in this context, the hormetic zone is synonymously known as the region of homeostasis. In pharmacology, the hormetic zone is similar to the therapeutic window. Some psychological or environmental fa factors that would seem to produce positive responses have also been termed eustress. In the context of toxicology, the hormesis model of dose response is vigorously debated. The biochemical mechanisms by which hormesis works, particularly in applied cases pertaining to behavior and toxins, remain under laboratory research and are not well understood. The notion that hormesis is an important policy factor for chemical risk regulations is not widely accepted. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the idea is that, like, any self-repairing system stressed the right amount, meaning not too much and not too little, will actually become stronger due to that. So, like, the, the best and easiest ex example is something like a muscle. You Like, a muscle is built and becomes stronger and capable of doing more work by breaking it down. And, like, the, pro the thing is, is that, like, if you, if you push any, like, if you push yourself too hard at the gym and, and you know really really overdo it then you can tear a muscle and at which point like without surgery you know your muscle would never recover from that it, like it, it would be it would be a broken system you know where, where you you got out of the homeostatic zone or whatever they called it <laughs> um that now the, the the controversial aspect of this is like people will, will make this apply to things like allergens okay so like whether it's peanut butter or uh different things like dust mites whatever whatever different things people can become allergic to and like it, it's been theorized that especially like in early development if kids are like super coddled and their immune system isn't exposed to to different things then then they, they can develop allergies later in life that will just be persistent so kind of like a it's kind of like an epigenetic expression is how i would think about it um but yeah so I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it's clearly true to some extent, but, but like, like, the, like the Wikipedia was saying, when it comes to toxicology, so it, it, it's, it's a little bit more controversial in that, you know, you, you, don't, you don't want to say, oh, a little bit of cancer is good, or a little bit of an, uh, a mutagen is good, or a little bit of, of something that's, you know, neurotoxic is, is actually good because of, homie, you know, hormesis. Like, it, it's just, it just seems like a slippery slope, and I think that it has been used as a slippery slope. You know, I think that they mentioned mercury, like, oh, so a small amount of mercury is actually 
good for the brain. I, I, you know, I haven't heard that, but like that would basically be the the, the takeaway or the, the thought process with it. And maybe there's actual data there. I mean, I don't know. Um, and it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I like the the apparent like um, data that they were pointing to or or thinking about and had in mind when they were proposing this this natural gas stove ban is that there's apparently been a correlation between asthma in, in young children and possibly adults in, into their adulthood and having a natural gas stove in the home. And it, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if the data says that, then the, the data says that I'll be curious how, how much peer review it has and like how, how much it, like how it develops over the next few months here. I mean, clearly, like now that the movement's already been created in politics, now it's just going to be a bloodbath. No one's going to, you know, actually be caring about the science anymore, which is frustrating. But um, I don't know. I'm not trying to say, oh yeah, don't don't have a fume hood and and like just like let your kids breathe natural gas fumes. It's like that's not what I'm saying. I, it's just it's it's a little bit complicated, and uh, it's like you got to like strike a balance between, you know keep making sure your 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 kid doesn't drive you know ride his bike off a cliff and and also that like he he's not like afraid of dirt you know like dirt and like actually gets exposed to to different things and has some type of hormetic response like within the therapeutic curve um let's move on so this guy i think i brought up his channel last podcast so hot right now your friend jim He's, he's great. Really enjoy him. Uh, I haven't watched a ton of his videos yet, um, but he talks about how AI is, is like moving into music now. That That's his main his main gig. And uh, even though it seems like he's kind of like a, an overall artist, I mean, he's a video artist too. Um, but it, this, this is a great video, probably the best one that I've seen so far by him. I, I've had some, some debates and, you know, I mean, not only with other people, but also with myself, just trying to figure out how I feel about uh, creative AI systems and, you know, how they're doing what they're doing, which is really by scraping the internet um, and, and scraping other artworks. And there's a lot of outrage over that because it, they, people are claiming that it's, uh, it's IP, trademark, copyright, whatever you want to call it, infringement, and that uh, they weren't uh, consulted or, or asked you know, for permission to, to actually access and scrape their work. And it's just, um, I don't know, it, it, like, it's really complicated. Nothing like this has ever existed before, but it, it really what it's like, it's like, it's like having a superhuman artist that can, that has access to the whole of, of human artistry that's been uploaded to the internet. And you can ask them to combine different styles and prerequisite uh, concepts together and like that that's really what it is it, it isn't like taking something and then like tracing over it or or like modifying it a little bit and, and like it, it's it's literally a unique creation each time and i mean it it just should we ban or try to or try to regulate the the superhuman aspect of this because it's not like it's it's like a carbon copy and, and a complete ripoff of whatever it's scraping it it isn't it's it's like people it's like a human being being inspired by work but just on a superhuman scale and like i don't know it's 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 complicated and tricky i i think that it I mean, it needs to be regulated to some extent, but can you really regulate its access to to human knowledge, like which is also in the form of artistry and and artwork in general, in the form of music and painting or whatever else? <clears throat> can you can you do that? And and if you and like even if you tried to do that, like via legislation, I I, I my my fear is that then you're just like putting the power into the, the hands of the few who are able to shirk that, that regulation. And it's like, how are you ever going to prevent it? How are you going to enforce that? Like what, what, it's, it's not like it's illegal to download the internet. Right. So I, I don't know. I, I just, there's a lot of ifs there. I, who knows, who knows what's going to happen. I don't think anyone really knows what's going to happen when it comes to these creative AIs. Um, here, th this is all, and this is relevant. Um, <laughs> are we irrelevant? So this is uh, Yuval Harari, um, right? He was up here, yeah. So he he, he did this this consciousness video, and he also did this labor irrelevance video, 
I just I literally just just listened to this uh, like 30 minutes before I started doing this. Um, it's just quick. It, I don't like the music. It's it's just like a clip of something that he probably said in a podcast or something. Um, but he basically talks about how it, it's not just that people are going to become subjugated to be serfs or peasants and and like to work for some amount of of sustenance and money it's like literally the the work that human beings will be able to provide will just become obsolete so like it, it will just become not relevant to to even want to support a human being's life to, in order to to extract the labor from them anymore I mean, that's a really sad and, you know, de depressing way of thinking about it. But I mean, that's that's what mechanical automation is. It's, you know, it's 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 taking the, the human labor and automating it and making it do done by a robot. And I mean, that's just increasingly is becoming the case. And, and it's it's like, how much can we control through legislation the 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 trajectory of of something of a natural process like that? And like I say, natural process, it's like. It's like the most unnatural process, but it, it's still naturally occurring here. And, and we're, I don't know, how, how much can we arrest or interrupt that? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I think that, and, and I guess, I guess I'll just like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll segue into like my, my like intuition or thought on it. And I'll tie it back to the beginning uh, with the morphic resonance thing. I think that the, the usefulness and the purpose of human beings is just going to be increasingly that of the teacher and that we we need to learn to not only teach ourselves and one another how to do things but also ironically enough teach the ais that like that that is what ai programming is it's training right so like we need to like if we're gonna actually do this in a positive way we need to say okay the ai is is going to need to take over the 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 labor and 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 the the workload that we're currently doing and how do we do that we train it and like and beyond that it's like well if if human beings are going to become irrelevant if they if human labor is going to become irrelevant then what is still relevant well it seems like the learning like the the, the teaching the training of you know one another and the ai like we, we need to have like a philosophical re renaissance where we start thinking about how to actually create nucleation points where where we train and program the the systems the right way and 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 not just you know like let, let the market fluctuations dictate our our trajectory and, and our future here i mean I, I think that it's pretty clear that that's a mistake so like we, we need to actually start identifying uh articulating and then teaching and training the solutions for the problems and you know rather than just looking at e each individual atomized thing as being a possible market value it's it, it needs to be more holistic than that and we need to look at at what human beings are actually going to be useful for because you know we're not we, we can't just we can't just bury our heads in the sands and the sand and say oh we're, we're just going to prevent technology from advancing it's like that, that's a fool's errand you're, you're all you're going to do is concentrate the wealth more and more in, into the hands of the people who are willing to to, to make that leap Um, all right, getting kind of close here to the end. Um, hope this was interesting. I don't want to say too much about this. I like, it's just really unfortunate. I, I, I feel bad, I, like in general, like not, not, I just feel bad for everyone involved and, and, and just angry that it, there, there doesn't really seem to be a way to talk about or, or reconcile, you know, any types, any types of nuanced thought with it. Um, if you haven't heard Andrew Callahan and pretty much at the same time, this uh, Justin Roiland, um, who's basically the like one of the, the two main creators of Rick and Morty. Um, he's they're, they're They're both in really deep crap right now because they they uh, did some really it seems like I mean, by Andrew's own uh, recognition and admission, he, he was uh, doing some really upsetting stuff uh, and really really pushing some girls way further than, than they, they wanted to go. And, um, I guess like what, what like finally pushed me to actually like talk about this is, is was actually the discrepancy between, uh, this Dr. Grande video. I, I like Dr. Grande generally, but like, I, I kind of felt like confused after I watched this video because 
I don't think that Andrew's uh, response video was the best in the world, you know, but it's like, what, or perfect, but I mean, it, it was, I think, better than nothing, and I think that he, he does say that, but like, Dr. Grande had one take, and I listened to his take, and then right after, because I was curious, because I felt like I had to re-watch Andrew's video because of how much differently he represented it than I remembered it, I watched This Wisecrack Live, and he, I mean, he also has the, the, the TikTok videos in it, which I think is good and, and relevant, but um, he kind of had a different take on Andrew's response, at least. And I, I put, like, I tacked uh, Bass Nectar on here at the end, if you don't know Bass Nectar, I mean, he, he was, he's, I mean, I, I love his music, his, 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 uh, his dubstep, whatever you want to call it, electro house music is, is amazing. And I've never been to one of his shows, but I've heard it's incredible. Um, but he was grooming young girls. I mean, like, it, it, I'm not sure if he's, if he's been like fully convicted of it, but he's, he's charged with, uh, with grooming young girls. And it's just, uh, I mean, what I wanted to kind of say is, all right, there, there's a big discrepancy in, in how uh, Grande and and Mike in, interpreted Andrew's response video. <clears throat> and then beyond that, like, clearly, there's a big difference between what Andrew's uh, accused of, what Justin's accused of, and what Bass Nectar's accused of. And it's just, it feels very frustrating that we can't even talk about the nuance between those things without it, it just being incredibly caustic and... and uh, just like like walking on eggshells like you, you you're 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 afraid to say anything or or try to articulate thoughts regarding it in any way other than that they're all pieces of shit and they're all horrible and they're all wrong and it's like clearly that's true but like th there there are levels of severity and like and clearly that 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 that's a, that's the case and and there is nuance involved here but like it just feels like it, it's it's an intractable situation where where it can't be discussed and I just think that's a real shame. And like, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to think a little bit more about it and, and try to articulate some more thoughts about it. Um, but right now it's just, it's just frustrating that it feels like an intractable problem that like can't be defined and can't be discussed. Um, and I did actually, uh, I, I'm sure you're going to love this. I, I generally love, um, Charlie, uh, moist critical penguins though. Uh, and, I, I watch his stuff pretty regularly, at least one video a day, I'm sure. Um, but I, I, I kind of have some problem with this now at this point. And like, I don't know. I like, I, I guess I probably should rewatch uh, the CoffeeZilla take on it. He's got like three videos on it and also uh, Scott Schaefer's stuff because it does seem like Logan was, was aware of, of the scan, like that he was doing something wrong, but I don't know. I, I, I really do need to rewatch it. I probably shouldn't have thrown this in here at the end. I, I, I guess that like just him saying continually saying scam, like at this point where Logan has now like apologized to coffee and like does seem like he, he wants to at least make some type of reparations and is going to pay back some of the money and like actually wants to have a conversation to just like, con like beat the dead horse now with, with continually calling it scam is just like, now you're just like disincentivizing him from from trying to to right his wrong here and like i, I just don't i don't like that attitude really like <clears throat> I, I i don't know i, I i'm trying to remember like how, how much evidence there actually was that logan was aware of this it's like i think that there's still a, a general possibility that logan like wanted to make his crypto zoo nft game and he just was completely negligent so like negligence isn't necessary like isn't <laughs> a, a, you know a, a free pass like you know negligence is, is a is a thing where it's it's a lack of, of of due diligence and effort to actually you know get get the job done the way that you're saying that you're going to it's like it's like saying i you know i want to build a plane but i don't want to buy any wings it's like you, you gotta you gotta do the due diligence and 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 not be negligent in in your building of the thing you want to and so he, he can be on the chopping block for that but like as far as like accusing him of of purposefully and intentionally setting up a scam is is a big is a very different thing i mean that, that's malicious versus incompetence and and those things are relevant and important so i don't know i, I mean I, I still think that there's there's a significant possibility that logan is just incompetent and that's i mean there's all types of incompetence and and like if, he often comes off as 
incompetent in the way that a sociopath is incompetent. And I don't mean to be, you know, cruel, but like that, that, that is, he, he comes off as cruel. Like he, he tased a rat. Like he, he, he's, you know, did the, the infamous, uh, suicide forest debacle and like, and all this stuff. And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> is that stuff hard baked into him? Like, is, is that just who he is? Is that just how he's going to be? I don't know, but you'd like to hope that there, there would be possible, like, potential and capacity for change there and like if he wants to come out and say that he's sorry and that he wants to do some do something to try to make it better for for the people who, who lost money then i think that he should be encouraged to do that and like i i just i just don't like beating a dead horse so anyway uh all right guys I, that's that's most of my thoughts here for the past week uh, if you want to give me a comment give me a like and a subscribe that